Oh, I didn't see you there. Come join me, won't you? Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to, this is going to be the final uh, video for this particular series, season number two of my musicianship and my friend's musicianship and how we've influenced each other over the years. And um, I would like to introduce everyone to David Prock. David, say hello. Oh, I didn't see you there. Come join me, will you? <laughs> That's my line. That's my life. Um, uh, people might not necessarily recognize me because I'm wearing a mustache. Uh, I uh, wanted to first and foremost honor uh, Adrian Kekis. Uh, he was a mutual friend of ours who unfortunately passed away uh, way too soon uh, because of cancer. Um, and uh, it is Movember. Uh, November the 4th, if I'm not mistaken. And so I had to have this on, of course, to um, represent. Uh, he was taken from us way too early, and um, it was such bad news uh, The when Bo, the, our drummer, had uh, given us the news. Um, and I just wanted to um, make sure that everyone checks their health, because that's important. I'm a registered nurse, but uh, I think it's important for each of us to look after ourselves as well as each other. Dave, uh, where are you hailing from? Toronto. Toronto. It's how we're going to be exact. Toronto. Toronto. Well, welcome to rural Alberta, where it's minus six degrees tomorrow. <laughs> and the sun sets too damn early in the winter time. It does, but it gives me better light control, so I kind of use that to my advantage. You used to play in the Thirst with us. Uh, how did that come about? Um, so you guys started off as a three-piece band, and then Paul came into the lineup, had a key keyboard, and then that, for whatever reason, you guys went back to being a three-piece, and then you called me up one day, like, hey, Dave! <laughs> and come jam with us, and I jammed with you guys. I think the first time was at Quadra, actually. Um, I saw pictures. I probably have video of it somewhere in the vault. And then I remember playing Lagrange uh, and um, Golden Earring, Radar Love. Yeah. Uh, anthem, the anthem of the of the thirst. And yeah, and then uh, I remember playing a couple more gigs with you guys. I don't think we ever we ever we played in bars or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But that was my that was my first ever experience uh, being in band, and let me tell you, that was way outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> like I didn't know what the etiquette is. I didn't know how to control my sound level. I didn't know where where I was in the mix. Um, how to like like what melodies do I throw in? When do I you know lay off a little bit? It was it was. The, the, it was a whole new experience, and when you're new to it at first, when you haven't grown up with music, it's a li it, it's 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 very discomfort. But like they always say, you need to be thrown out of your comfort zone. You need to experience that discomfort in order to grow. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I at times like to uh, jam with people I don't know, people who are better than me uh, at parties um, or meeting new folks when I go to a different town and. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Really? <laughs> There's lots of people better than me. Oh. <laughs> and uh, okay. that, that uh, getting outside your comfort zone is important because then you grow as a player. It's also humbling too, which is really nice too. I think some uh, musicians can use a, little, a dab of that. Uh, and uh, let me tell you, Bo, Andy and I really enjoyed making you uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> we would throw things at you all the time. There's this one solo where you're playing and we're just like, and then continue, and you're just like, what? I'm gonna con well, you continue yeah. the solo, and then we did it again, and then we did it again to you. Oh, it was so much fun, putting yeah, you on the like, spot. Like, guys, guys, I, I can't, like, my creative juices only know so much, like, how to, how to improvise a solo. I can... <laughs>
and you were so low on the volume. We were just like, turn it up, turn it up. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you had a really good time. We really uh, enjoyed it, uh, especially those uh, um, cottage parties over at Andy's uh, place, uh, his uh, big uh, cabin on the hill. Um, and of course, uh, the crowd that uh, um, we were kind of growing up with at the time, too. Close friends, everyone, including Adrian Kekis, um, yeah. Matt and Tom, and uh, the twins, uh, Bo's uh, uh, younger brothers there, uh, Andrew and Walter. Um, yeah. and, and it, it turned out to like, uh, evolve into like multi-cottage jam fest as well, too, because everyone from different cottages would come and coalesce. And for me, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to include you in that kind of scene. Because uh, I knew you were really smart. I knew you knew how to play keyboards. I knew that you are also very influenced by Jay, your brother, and um, David, your brother. Sorry, uh, Jeff, your brother. So I, I knew that you would fit. And you did, and it was great, and we had a lot of good times. Unfortunately, the thirst kind of had to dissolve. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you continued playing music. Um, before we go any further with this line of conversation, though, uh, maybe we should introduce to the audience um, who you are, how we met, uh, how we first started playing music together. Or maybe even growing up. Do you remember when we were... Uh, on a bus together, uh, back at St. Demetrius. Um, bus number four. Yeah, with June Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> Sit your buttons down in that seat, Billy. <laughs> oh boy. The smell of diesel fumes and cigarette smoke, I'll never forget it. Uh, and she had that long pinky nail, it was fucking disgusting. Oh, um, God. someone was using hairspray and she had an allergic reaction and uh, you used the CB radio to call in an emergency. Yeah, that was you. No. Nope. That wasn't you? Who was that? That was, probably, that was probably Jeff. You think Jeff did that, hey? Oh, I was way too young. There's uh, no way I would have had the intelligence to do that. I remember you being so young but really smart. You knew directions. You knew street maps of Toronto way better than I did Not at your age. to this day. I grew up in a pretty musical family. My dad played the accordion extremely well. My mom was a singer, and my my oldest brother, Jeff, was one of those jack-of-all-trades. He can pick up any instrument and just play it. Uh, my other brother, Jay, is really, really good on the guitar. And um, keyboards, I got into much later on in life. So I got into, so let me backtrack a little bit. I did piano lessons for about a year or two when I was about seven or eight years old. Picked it up very, very fast, but also got bored really, really, really fast. Oh. And, so, and that's that. That's a typical storyline for most, you know, seven to nine year olds who get into piano. Yeah. It was all folk music and, and classical and, and all that. Yeah, and, theory and uh, yeah, classical. That. Yeah. So that just kind of fell off my radar for a lot of years. And fast forward to 2004 when I was at a local bar and I saw a band called The Thirst Play, which was fronted by this uh, guy called Adrian. <laughs> yep, yep, guilty. Um, Andy and uh, Bobo. And they got me into classic rock. I wasn't a big rock head growing up, but in that era, in the, the mid-2000s, when, when I really, really got into it. And then you guys played for about, about two, two years in, and then one night you added Paul, the keyboardist, to the lineup. Yeah. Because you guys were originally three-piece, and then you added him to the lineup. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching you guys at the old sod, and I remember the depth, it, like, the key, like the color that keyboards added to the mix. It took this black and white flow, a photo and just, uh, just, and just made a color. Mm. That's and a it, really good way of putting it. Uh, some people see uh, sounds as color with a synesthesia, but if you're using it as a straight metaphor, that's pretty cool too. Yeah. And I was, I was fascinated by the solo. And then 
in the house um, that I was living at at the time had a keyboard in the basement. And I was just kind of dabbling on it a little bit. I'm like, okay, so this is a C major scale, um, relative minor, A minor. And then like, okay, so then... And then, and then if I flatten the fifth, I get this pentatonic, bluesy sound to it, okay? And then, oh, wait a second, but if I hold all those notes together in that scale, you get a minor seventh. I'm like, okay. And then if I just shift it up, I do, I, you know, by, um, by six half steps, you get F minor seventh. I'm like, okay. And then it was just this math that was just clicking together that all made sense. I never studied music theory to that extent. Like, when I was in piano lessons before growing up, it was just like very, very basic, uh, you know, C major scale and the most basic elementary sight reading. So it was really fascinating to just like kind of pick this up and and uh, browse some information online. And then the rest is all history from there. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up, you have a musical family. You had a lot of influences from uh, your brothers. I had a lot of influences too, but uh, my brother was exceptionally, is exceptionally talented in music. Uh, see the YouTube video about me interviewing him. Your brother Jeff and your brother Jay, who is great, smooth personality. He's ultra cool. And uh, you also came out to be uh, very musical. Um, there's also um, your dad playing I'm accordion. Jay is cooler than me, so I, will, I just, just want that on the record. Yeah, what? Who? Jay is cooler than me, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, but on the topic of accordion playing, it's, it's a fascinating instrument because nobody ever just picks up an accordion and self teaches it themselves. Unlike a lot of other instruments out there, no. It accordion is such a disciplined instrument, and I tried to play it before, and it is really, really difficult because like you're basically playing blind. And yeah, you you're are. Trying to feel your, you're trying to feel your way around the bass, and you're trying to you're trying to play the, the right hand, but you're not really like you can't really look down. It's awkward like that, and. It's a really, really tough instrument, so anybody who can play it well, I really, really commend them uh, because a lot of um, because a lot of practice, a lot of very, very strict practice went into that. Very cool, very cool. So hats off to your dad. Keyboards is my main thing. This is my beloved Nord Stage 2. Yeah. I've had this for quite a number of years, and I promised myself to upgrade it only if I get better as a musician. So if I don't get better, I'm still going to continue to use this. I find that too many musicians out there are obsessed with getting gear, yep. and I always preach that 95% of the sound comes from these things. And I want to tell everybody, stop buying gear and just <laughs> use, learn to use what you have. That's right. Practice, practice. I'm, practice makes awesome. I'm part of all these forums, and where everyone's like, oh, I want to get to stage three. I want to upgrade from the stage two. Well, it's the, and, and the thing is that the, the, the differences are so musical with these things. And learn to work with what you got. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Everyone's got to start somewhere, right? And everyone has uh, fond memories of uh, playing their first guitar. Like, you'll never forget that. Uh, yeah. Some people are just like, oh, I wish I had it. I'd spend as much money as I can to get it back again. And, well, it's too late. You've already moved on and, yeah. um, you know, career's taken off where it hasn't. Um, yeah. What's really fascinating about keyboards manufactured in the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years um, is that I watch these classic rock live shows from the 60s and 70s, and you see these keyboardists on stage, and they're just like, there's a grand piano, there's a Fender Rhodes, you have a Hammond B3 organ, yeah. and they have, like, you need, like, an army of people to haul this around. <laughs> like, I, I can't imagine the logistics and the price just so that a keyboardist can play a variety of sounds at its gates. Like, I take this thing, and it does every all that and more. So it's really, really fascinating to see what you think, what, what you can pack in a single board. Yep, yep. And uh, being creative on how to use with the gear that you have um, yep. and create your own particular sound too. Uh, that's also a fun 
challenge. Um, I play uh, a lot of acoustic guitar, but I am sick and tired of playing in standard tuning. I have now my signature sound in Dadgad, and I have created a lot with it. I, I can switch back to standard tuning, and if I'm playing covers in a gig, then sure, I'll do that. But with any guitar, I'll just Dadgad, and instantly I've got my thing, my sound. Uh, same it instrument. Out of the box. It breaks you out of the Oh, absolutely. And defines me as a musician. This is like my thing. Um, I find that's kind of important. You, f I guess, found your way, but you were also influenced by your brother's musical choices. Because I remember Jeff uh, being my age and growing up with him, along with Bo and Andy, through uh, St. Demetrius Catholic, Ukrainian Catholic School, um, and then the, um, uh, Bishop Allen Academy for high school. He was huge into Led Zeppelin. And... I kind of, I was more into British New Wave, whatever was popular at the time. That genre, but I know that your brother David was a huge Zep head. Sorry, your brother uh, Jeff was a huge Zep head. And then Jason came out and he was playing Slash and Guns N' Roses and, and he came out with his own uh, style. Um, his, 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 his own excellence. Uh, so I'm yeah. happy to hear that you picked up, uh, or you again picked up, uh, keyboards. I know, I saw the photo, god damn! Yeah. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Speaking of, back in the day, uh, Jeff and I were talking not too long ago, and we brought up serendipity. Ah! <laughs> the jazz ensemble, the choir from Bishop Allen that we were in, yeah. The oversized purple shirts, I remember that. Yes, yes, uh, and the name Serendipity came from a Canadian book called Brothers by Choice that we had to read in grade 8. Yeah, oh, okay. that, that, that takes us back. That definitely takes yeah. me back. Adrian Tanchak was there as well. Um, uh, we were able to harmonize, and that was a lot of fun. We did some doo-wop and Motown, uh, so I have an appreciation for that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah. Did that help you? Did, like, like, when you look back, do you think that helped you being in an ensemble like that, as well as like, doing stage band with Lejeune like, and all that? Um, I didn't do stage band, but uh, doing the choir ensemble, yes. The harmonization, uh, listening to yourself as well as other people at the same time, um, having fun um, to sight read and to do vocal warm ups. Uh, me, ma, mu, ma, me, no, me, ma, 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 mu, and just the, the, the different uh, vocal intonations and how to use uh, the lips in different ways and, and the importance of being able to function as a group. Um, yeah, that was, that was really good. Uh, especially in high school because we were teenagers and so we were very impressionable so that stuff lasts with you lasts with you a long time another thing I have to mention uh, is you know a lot of people and you invite them over to your house for house parties uh, I've been to a few thank you very much and they were always a really good time you know how to throw a party dude Ah, <laughs> such a gracious host. I know. I'm, just, I'm just providing the, the floor space and, and the fridge <laughs> and all that. People just, people just show up and they, it's the people that make it a great time. I'm huge on having house parties because people are just, they're a lot more unfiltered, they stay a lot longer. So, so that's been the tradition every year for my birthday. That's important. And uh, you just celebrated your birthday last week. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was an anniversary of sorts, wasn't it? What did you say it was? Having a Prague house party. The 20th? At the so, 20th. Yeah, so 2002 was the first time I had a house party for my birthday. I held it at my parents. And every single year, it's been a house party. Ever since. Awesome. Between the house that I grew up in, uh, between uh, living at Islington and Dundas for a bit, moving, uh, living here, every year it's been a house party. So, happy to keep that tradition. 
Very cool. Uh, on Facebook, I would see pictures of everyone together and you having um, the camera uh, pointed at yourself in the middle and just capturing everyone. Big smiles and everyone's having a great time. Um, I wish I could uh, participate more often, but I'm uh, I'm I'm far north. I'm I, I got Santa Claus as a neighbor now. With the goats. Yeah, yeah, Gracie and Cornell. Uh, they've been wonderful. Um, uh, Cornell unfortunately passed away. Uh, named him after Chris Cornell. He I, I returned him to nature. Um, but I've got Gracie, and uh, she's a, um, a wannabe YouTube super sensation. Uh, country queen she is, and uh, I take her out for walks, and I'm putting together a goat shack for her, in addition to the one that I've got already. So, um, uh, in some ways, yeah, I'm blessed. I feel like it. Now, I've been trying to continue my musicianship, and I'm going to be having a few more gigs coming up shortly, uh, November, December. I'm not going to be playing uh, the Christmas party here at the um, at the hospital. That's going to be fun. Uh, coming up on the 20th of December. Be there. Um, but you too have also continued your musicianship after the thirst. Um, yes. What have you been up to? So the thirst was at the actual first... Like, it was the first actual band I ever played with. And then after that was several years of just being in and out of bands, trying, seeing, seeing what's out there. And so for the past nine, ten years, I've been with a cover band called All Natural Flavors. Yeah. Yes. Five-piece band. Uh, most of the guys are from Mississauga. And it was it just started off as a fun project. Um, the, the, all um, uh, the guys in there already kind of they, they all kind of knew each other from around from high school or the community or whatnot and I found them through a Craigslist ad believe it or not Craigslist awesome yeah and then when I first found uh, when I first jammed with them it was it was amazing like the, the chemistry was there uh, because there were a lot of failures things that would fall apart that a lot of bands would fall apart leading up to it like you know what it's like being in a band. It's really hard to keep things together because people have different goals and aspirations and they different outcomes and responsibilities and all that. So that's been my main thing for the past 10 years. And we started off as very like grungy, red hot chili peppers, queens of the stone age. Um, we were doing open mic circuits. And then we got to regular rotation at one of, uh, at, a, at a pretty big pub. And then we start our, our set list started to change a little bit to, to to cater to a different audience, and then we started throwing in Spice Girls and Backstreet Boys. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, a little bit on the less grungier side, a little bit more on the on the pop side. Well, cater catered uh, to the but, ladies, yeah. We have three sets. We have set one, set two, and then the drunk sets. <laughs> <laughs> the drum set are the tunes that if you heard it on the car, while you're driving in the car, you change the station, not think of it. But the second you're drunk, you, all of a sudden you you, you 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 love it. It's a banger. It's an anthem. Yeah. I'm talking about the uh, Don't Stop Believing, a Sweet Caroline. Yeah, yeah. Songs like that. And to this day, it's just it's just fascinating to see the reaction that we get when we play those songs. Uh, after, Absolutely after 10 years, yeah, I'm sure you, you really kind of hone the skills. Um, you mix and match and you find what works, what doesn't. Um, and yeah. I'm happy to hear that the chemistry was really, really, really good. Um, yeah. You're right, uh, bands fall apart. Uh, I know uh, The Thirst, unfortunately, weren't able to continue. Um, Andy getting married and having a kid. Bo having his business. Uh, me um, going through university and burning the candle at both ends. And... Um, having to make some serious personal choices about having to commit to school and then a job uh, at the hospitals as a registered nurse. Um, I'm happy. I'm so happy that uh, you were able to get the best of what we could do at the Thirst and then ca continue to carry on a torch, as it were, uh, with your musicianship and finding a set of cool guys. Two of the members are Croatian, and somehow we got into playing Croatian tunes. <laughs> what? So yeah. 
And what's interesting is that the three out of five members that aren't Croatian love playing Croatian music, including myself. Really? Is it kind of like a polka or, or what? It's very polka. I mean, like, there's like the older stuff that's more like, you know, like the, the traditional stuff, but there's a lot of like the newer uh, poppy stuff, but like the, 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 the folkier traditional music really? is, like, is very, very similar to Ukrainian stuff. Oh wow! So kind of like mosquito bar duo or, or trio, um, that's that's pretty interesting. I I didn't think that uh, you would go in that particular direction, but you have. Good for you, man. It it just worked out that way, and we're actually getting into um, a lot of weddings that are Croatian mixed. So one side, it, it's great because. One side of the wedding is Croatian, and the other side is non-Croatian. They might be of a different European background or whatever. So it, um, a lot of couples um, with one side being Croatian, they didn't want the best of both worlds. They want a little bit of Crow music, but they also want to hear Top 40. So we're pretty much the only band that, that can provide both. So it, it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, you're you're filling a niche, and a gig is a gig, right? And wedding gigs pay decent money. Yeah, I mean it's it's not about the money. It's it's more about the energy of the party, the energy of the people. That's what that's what really really counts. That that's the magic for sure. Uh, money definitely nice, um, but uh, yeah. if you are going to be playing for a bunch of other guys that. Uh, have a, a, like a toehold into a, per, a certain niche and it works with your set, then yeah, go for it. And uh, weddings, they're a blast. Everyone is there dedicated to have a good time and celebrate. So yeah, why not? They are also a lot of work because we're often the first vendor on site because we have to set up and sound check before anything starts. Oh. And we play until last call. Yeah, okay. So, so if, you, if you do the math on that, though, these are very, very long days. Yeah, that, that's it's the nuts actually, and bolts of it, right? Because you have to set up the stage um, uh, in, in a, what, uh, a banquet hall that has got electricity, but pretty much nothing else. Maybe they have a sound system? No. Yeah, we, see? Uh, we have, we, we've always had to supply our own sound system, especially if, what, uh, if these weddings are outside of the GTA. Like, for example, like if it's Somewhere in, Niag uh, somewhere in Niagara, you know, we can't, <laughs> we got, we got to have it early in the morning. So they are, they are a lot of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but the energy at some of these parties are just, it's amazing. <laughs> and then of course, then there's the tear down. Um, a lot of people who yeah. participate in these sorts of events, the non-musicians that, you know, are having a blast, um, they don't necessarily appreciate how much work goes into setting up. Of course, being there, having a great time, but then you're exhausted. You got to take everything down and pack it up into a van and then drive it home. Like, oh my god! Yeah. But if it wasn't fun, you wouldn't be doing it, right? Yeah, and so I've also played with a couple of original bands on the side as well. Ooh, side and bands, side projects, yeah. cool. What's all that about? It's an original uh, punk ska fusion. What's it called? Deal. Amy Gaba and the almost, almost famous. And the almost famous. And yeah, and it's it's amazing playing with an original band because you're playing at the, the um, you're you're playing at dive bars where you're usually one of three bands. Um, much much younger crowd. It's a very very different crowd and a different reaction from the crowd. But do you so also get really to. Cool. You get to expand your circuit, play at different places that you'd never played before, right? Exactly. And what's what the difference between those places? People go there to actually see the band. Ah. Uh. When we play covers, people are, are there to just socialize. And like maybe they'll kind of like pay attention to the music, they'll sing and dance along or whatever. But that music isn't as much of a focus as it is when you watch these original shows. So it's a very, very different experience, mm. and it's really nice to get that change, um, change of scenery, as well as like break out of your comfort zone a little bit. Because you know when you're with when you're with a band for ten years, you kind of work into a groove or whatever. It works, but 
but sometimes you kind of need to be challenged every now and then. Um, maybe not necessarily challenged, but also just you need that change of scenery just to kind of keep things fresh. And yeah, yeah, the chemistry is different. You get different exposures, different experiences, and it's all learning. You get to apply yeah. everything that you put together, and then, oh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful magic. Yeah. Um, years ago, I was actually, there was one point in time I was in three bands, and I thought, oh, it's so cool, I'm going to load, I'm going to load all these nights up, and then practices together, and boy, did I learn quality over quantity is, is, is the way to go. That's a valuable lesson, hey? You have to, like, some, some people can handle it, some people can do music seven days a week and be perfectly fine with it. I need, I need rest, I need space, otherwise you just get drunk. Yeah, and you have a full-time job too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's it. Oof. I remember burning the candle at both ends when I was playing with the thirst. I was pulling my hair out. It was hard. Um, like I was cracking, and that was not fun. Not fun. But again, yeah. uh, a good learning experience, all the same. Sadly, it's time to go. So thank you very much for uh, coming all the way from Toronto here by uh, the magic of the internet to uh, participate with uh, this, my final uh, installment of season number two. Um, so again, thank you very much for participating. And also as an homage to you that you, know, you, were, you were cool at some point in your life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> so you can play these videos back when you're in your 70s. That's right. Yeah, uh, something to look forward to. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again. So, again, thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, goodbye.